So, Series 1 of the most recent Doctor Who reboot recently concluded, and as a fan of the previous eras, I have a lot of feelings about it that I want to share. Just a disclaimer, these are all just my opinions. At the end of the day, it's a TV show, and it's really not that deep whether I like it or not. Okay, let's go. So, last year's Christmas special was messy. First of all, let me say I'm happy we're getting episodes on Christmas Day again instead of New Year's Day. That change was stupid. But in terms of the actual episode, I didn't find a whole lot to like here. One of my problems is that there's nothing really Christmassy about the episode. It could have been at any time of year. The only reason it was at Christmas was so it matched up with Ruby's birthday, but the actual Goblin story had nothing to do with the holiday. Speaking of Ruby, I think this episode was a decent introduction to her. We got an alright semblance of her character and set up to her story, but I feel she didn't show as much personality as previous companions. That's fine though, it's only one episode. I'm sure we'll see her and the Doctor's relationship develop throughout the series. Right? When it comes to the Doctor, I was a bit disappointed by him. I think Shuti Gawa is a fantastic actor, and he was great throughout this episode and the rest of the series, but he's let down so much by bad writing. One of my large problems with this episode is that he doesn't really get a Doctor moment. Let me explain what I mean. Look at Matt Smith's first episode. He gives a speech to the Atraxia about how he protects Earth overcoming being high on regeneration energy and actually locking in as the Doctor. Because we've skipped some time between 14 by generating into 15 in this episode, Shooty's Doctor has already overcome this and so doesn't really get a chance to prove himself. Sure, he has his classic I'm the Doctor line at the end of the episode, but I think it would have hit much harder if he was still dealing with regeneration issues. I have one more thing to say about this episode. Nice to meet you. Nice to greet you. Nice to say how diddly deet you. What was that? You've rebooted the show to try to get people back on board, made a deal with Disney to try and get it into the global market, and the first thing you do is make a musical number about goblins eating babies with the Doctor and Ruby freestyling to escape. Come on, man. Fast forward five months, and we get the start of the actual series. Again, let's start with the good. I like the abortion metaphor here a lot. I think Doctor Who is usually at its best when it has a political message, and it's nice to get back here after some ropey episodes in Chibnall's era. The scene where Ruby and the Doctor learn the planet below won't let anyone turn off the baby-making machine, but then refuses to help the babies once they've been born is a good way of telling that story. And I like the way Ruby understands and relates to the situation by saying it's not that strange. However, the babies are one of my issues with this episode. They're so gimmicky and annoying, and they just make the show feel like it's been Disneyfied, which was my main concern going into the reboot. I gotta be honest, rural life babies annoy me a lot, so putting animal farm level CGI mouths on them and having them cry constantly didn't do the episode any favours. I also hate the humour that comes with them. Ew, Ruby, you're covered in snot, like come on, are we on CBeebies? And why is there a running joke that the Doctor and Ruby correct themselves to say space babies each time they say babies? Like, cool, you said the name of the episode, but they're just regular babies, you don't have to do it ten more times. My main issue with this episode is that the Doctor runs away without asking questions. Now, I know this is later explained by the boogeyman being created to scare people and force them to run, and I think this is a cool idea, but if you want to use it, don't have it in a Doctor's first proper episode. Like I said earlier, the BBC wants to widen the show's audience, mainly by marketing to Americans and having the new series on Disney+. Plus. A lot of these new viewers probably skipped the Christmas episode, so this will be their first time seeing the Doctor, and they see him run out of fear. The Doctor being scared of their enemies is nothing new. It happens multiple times each series, but it's so effective because they're usually such a light-hearted and confident character, so seeing this fear in them tells us that this creature is a genuine threat. However, when you haven't built up the Doctor this way, it just makes the character seem weak. Additionally, running away is what we would all do. It's what Ruby would do, so it shouldn't be what the Doctor does. The whole foundation of the show is the mystery around the Doctor and the difference between them and their companions. Them and us. Companions give a human perspective, allowing the audience to insert themselves into a story on a planet they've never heard of facing aliens they know nothing about. The Doctor is a beacon of hope, curiosity and knowledge that guides us through that story. Yes, there are times where the Doctor acts human, and these usually build up their character and form a bond between them and their companion, but most of the time they need to act like a Time Lord. I'm not saying the Doctor should never run away, they do that in literally every episode and it works, but they should run while asking questions, while figuring out the situation, while being curious, not because they're too scared to go the other way. The Devil's Chord is a very, very frustrating episode for me, and that's because, like this entire series, there are little glimmers of something fantastic that gets overshadowed by a cloud of poor decisions and bad writing. I'm going to start with the final battle here, which is weird, but just bear with me. In the final altercation, the Doctor has a mini monologue to the Maestro about how he has lived and loved and can only smile the way he does because he's lost so much. This is golden, it's exactly what the Doctor as a character represents. 
Shooty nails this delivery. These 20 seconds are the most anyone has felt like the Doctor in the last seven years, excluding that one scene where 14 talks to the toy maker about his dead companions. Unfortunately, this little shimmer of gold is surrounded by, in my opinion, a terrible episode. Okay, so the Beatles. They were one of the main focuses of literally every trailer for this series. They were mentioned so many times during the promotion of the show, and they're hardly in the episode. It's so obvious they were only written in for marketing purposes, and look, I get it, people are going to be interested in seeing the Doctor interact with the Beatles, but if you want to include them, have them in it for more than two scenes. Maestro was the other big aspect of this episode's promotion, and... Christ. This is a cool idea for a character, and I think Jinx Monsoon is a good choice to play them, but why put them here? It is Shooty's second regular episode as the Doctor, and you're putting him up against a member of the Pantheon. That's like if Kevin Feige saw the success of Iron Man and said, let's have him fight Thanos in the very next movie. Having an enemy of this scale this early just makes the rest of the episodes feel lacklustre. How am I meant to care about big stationary slugs when I've seen the Doctor take down a demigod? Also, I'm sure this is an issue with directing rather than acting, but Jinx's performance feels like if you told a year 9 drama class to act crazy. Everything feels exaggerated just for the sake of it. It's fine to have over-the-top characters, they can work really well sometimes, but they need to actually fit into the setting and story, or else they feel out of place. The special effects are also terrible. Now, normally this isn't something I complain about. I mean, look at some of the effects from previous eras. But when you've been given a much bigger budget per episode from Disney, you don't have an excuse for the CGI looking the exact same as it did 10 years ago. To clarify, I'm not blaming the 3D artists and animators for this, these roles are constantly overworked and I'm sure they want to make the best product possible. I'm blaming the studio for not giving enough time or money to this aspect of production. Another issue I have is that, when Ruby and the Doctor run away from Maestro, Ruby says something along the lines of, You're running, but you never run. I know we're meant to infer that they've gone on adventures between episodes, but as an audience of the main series, we've only seen Shooty run. I know this is a nitpick, but this line just really frustrated me. It's not the worst line of the episode, though. That's when the Doctor tries to show Ruby her time without music, and she says they came from July 2024. July? That means we've skipped six months between the last episode and this one. All the time Ruby and the Doctor had to bond is just gone, skipped over. Say goodbye to all the progression of the companion getting to trust the Doctor, those cute friendship moments in the TARDIS, any character development, because now we just get story, story, story. The relationship between a Doctor and their companions is one of the most important parts of Doctor Who, but we've just skipped from Ruby meeting the Doctor to them being best mates. To me, this is the most frustrating part of this new series. Episodes are 10 to 15 minutes longer than before, but we get way less time with the Doctor and Ruby. We have no idea about the dynamic of their relationship or any real key moments that have built up their friendship. Personally, I don't care about Ruby as a character because I haven't seen her act as a person so far. I've only seen her used as a plot device. Speaking of Ruby, I think the foreshadowing for her parents is quite bad. Maestro gives the least subtle suggestions I've ever seen about the person at the church in the Christmas special. Also, the snow. I have an issue with the snow. Doctor Who is no stranger to having recurring elements pop up as part of an overarching story. The most famous recent example is probably the crack in the wall that shows up throughout Matt Smith's tenure. Having things like this show up over and over again is a cool idea, and it works for the type of storytelling the show leans itself towards, but it needs to be done correctly. The crack in the wall showed up in almost every episode in season 5, but it was for one shot at the end of the episode. It would be behind the TARDIS as it teleported, or on the wall of a spaceship and the characters wouldn't see it. When it did show up in front of the characters and they acknowledged it, it actually meant something to the story of the episode. The Doctor sent all the angels into it, or Rory got sucked into the light. These are good examples of this type of storytelling because it builds suspense for the audience and we actually get a glimpse of how the narrative is going to progress. On the other hand, the snow in this season feels really cheap. To me at least. It seems like every time something important happens, it starts to snow and everyone acknowledges it. Maestro points out, the Doctor talks about it, old woman Ruby tells a nurse that she can make it snow. Every time this happens, it feels like the writers are going, the snow guys, remember the snow, don't forget about the snow, the snow's going to be important, like shut up. If the snow shows up a lot, we can figure out that it's important, you don't need to remind us about it at every opportunity. I've spent too much time on this episode already, but just quickly, the musical number at the end, what was that man, like come on, please. Boom is genuinely the saving grace of this entire series, it's the only episode I fully enjoyed. That's mainly because it was written by Stephen Moffat, the man I think should have come back as showrunner instead of Russell T Davies. I mean, if you're trying to reboot a show, why bring back an old showrunner anyway, but if you're going to do that, I think it should have been Moffat. Boom had so much tension throughout the episode, it's the only instance I've genuinely cared about the characters throughout this season. 
The Doctor actually feels like the Doctor here, taking his power and movement away to put him in a situation where he has to rely on his intelligence and his ability to convince people to survive is phenomenal. It creates the perfect setting for a Doctor Who story. I think Shooty was brilliant throughout this episode, he perfectly blended fear, anger and desperation to capture the audience's attention. I feel like this episode is the only time we see a good indication of this Doctor's personality. I also really liked the blend of criticism and acceptance of religion and faith throughout this episode. I think this is the perfect way to discuss a topic like this within Doctor Who. At first, faith in general causes issues for the Doctor, and this religious war is what gets him into this situation with the landmine. The show comments on the danger of blindly believing everything you're told and following instructions without questioning them. It shows the danger of faith, but by the end of the episode it also displays how people benefit from it, giving characters hope and light in an otherwise dark scenario. Overall, this is my favourite episode of the series by far, but there are still a couple nitpicks I have. Since I've spoken a lot about the negatives of the episodes I don't like, I think it's only fair to do it for the one that I do. First of all, I didn't love that Ruby was just kind of removed from the second half of the episode. It works as a way to make the Doctor angry, but I didn't really feel worried about Ruby at all. I think this is largely because of the issue I have with Ruby and the Doctor's development, and also the fact it seems Ruby is about to die in every single episode. When a character is constantly in a near-death scenario, I'm going to stop caring about them being in those scenarios. In a similar vein, I thought the use of the snow was kind of weak. Again, if it just snowed without everyone pointing it out, I'd be fine with it. It's just annoying when every single character goes, oh my god, it's snowing every episode. I thought the ambulance trying to find Ruby's next of kin was a really cool idea, but it would have worked so much better if the show didn't mention Ruby's family every single episode as well. Speaking of the ambulance, I do quite like the idea of Susan Twist's character showing up across multiple episodes. It feels a lot more natural as a recurring element because the characters just kind of say she looks familiar most of the time, or they don't notice her at all. Everyone seems to love 73 Yards, and I really don't understand why. To me, this episode felt so misguided and mashed together. It felt like RTD had two stories, Ruby seeing the old woman and Ruby stopping the nuclear war, then tried to smash them together because he couldn't develop either of them into a full episode. Okay, so first of all, this is a companion-only episode. These are cool, they can work really well to develop a companion's confidence, when they actually remember it. Yes, this episode does have a good setup for whatever role Susan Twist is going to play in the finale, but it just feels like a waste of 50 minutes where you could have told a really good story. Since the Doctor isn't really in this episode, it's up to Ruby to figure out what's going on and fix it. In Boom, Ruby risks her life to save the Doctor, showing they have a very strong relationship that was nurtured through months of travelling together. In 73 Yards, Ruby says, I wasn't even with him for that long and after the scene in the pub, doesn't spend any time trying to figure out what happened to the Doctor. Naturally, working out what's going on with the woman following her is going to be her priority, that's fine, but you'd think she'd search for him a bit over the course of the 60-something years in this episode. I also have a problem with the nuclear war segment of this episode. It's an issue that also applies to Dot and Bubble and Rogue, but I'll go into the specifics about those in their own sections. Okay, so political stories should absolutely be used in art. Media should be a way for us to discuss and critique real-world issues. However, these stories need to feel like they were written to revolve around this political message in order for them to work. To me, it feels like Russell T Davies was halfway through writing this episode when he just decided he wanted to talk a bit about nuclear war. This storyline feels shoehorned in. I think these two stories should either be in two completely separate episodes or split into a two-parter. To be honest, this is a problem I have with the entire series. Every episode is just, the Doctor and Ruby are already at this place, sometimes they already know about the issue, watch them filibuster for 45 minutes and then actually do something. Back to 73 Yards, I really hate the ending. Having Ruby be the old woman is such a cheap twist, I don't even know if you can call it a twist. Also, this means Ruby is scaring people away from herself. I know she can't go up and talk to her younger self because she doesn't want to mess up her own timeline, but she can literally just tell Unit to stop Roger Ab William. This isn't a fixed point in time, it's in flux, meaning Ruby can change the events taking place. If this were to create a grandfather paradox, she can just tell Unit to help Ruby instead of doing it for her, and she can also just not scare her own mother away? Also, what could old Ruby possibly have said to Roger to make him run the way he did? She wasn't given a special power. The plot isn't even resolved at the end of the episode. The whole story just really frustrates me. Also, shut up with the I could make it snow. We know, Ruby. We know. A lot of people also liked Dot and Bubble. And I didn't. First of all, the majority of this episode was the most basic phone bad story imaginable. It felt like ChatGPT watched all the bad Black Mirror episodes and just regurgitated a story. The main character was unbearably annoying. I know she's meant to be unlikable, I mean good, racists are unlikable, but I actually just wanted to turn my TV off when she was saying she can't walk without the arrows telling her where to go. 
This is really pedantic, I know, but the arrows don't control our legs, you'd still be able to move without them. I know it's a metaphor for people not being able to think for themselves and always needing instruction, but the fact that it's a metaphor doesn't mean logic can just go out the window. Little nitpicks like this really frustrate me, which is probably more of an issue with me than the show, but I still thought it was worth mentioning. I mentioned the main character there, and I wasn't talking about the Doctor. In this episode, and really this whole series, the Doctor and Ruby are just side characters. They don't feel like they have any real impact on the universe. There's no adventure in this episode. The Doctor and Ruby are already there, they already know how to solve the issue, so we just have to watch them give instructions for 50 minutes. The fact the Doctor took an entire episode to figure out people were being killed alphabetically is so weak, he's meant to be an incredibly smart character. I also briefly mentioned the fact that the protagonist of this episode is racist, so let's talk about that. It would be stupid for the show to ignore the fact that Shooty is the first black actor to play the mainstream Doctor. There's the fugitive Doctor in Chibnall's era, but she's not a protagonist so it doesn't really apply to my point here. With a black actor playing the character for the first time, Doctor Who should absolutely explore themes of race, ethnicity and discrimination in a way the show couldn't do before. This is a brilliant opportunity for new forms of storytelling and for new voices to be heard in a primetime TV show. Yes, this episode delves into racism towards the Doctor and how it impacts the character, but we're not hearing a new voice. I have my problems with Russell T Davis as a writer for multiple reasons, but here, I just don't think he's the right person to tell this story. I also have problems with the way racism is displayed in this episode. It's foreshadowed a bit throughout the story with everyone in fine time being white and with Lindy listening to Ruby way more willingly than listening to the Doctor. At the end, it's very clear Lindy has prejudice against the Doctor, saying online contact is bad enough and calling his TARDIS voodoo. However, I personally feel that this aspect of the story is not given the time it needs to be displayed properly. As I've said throughout this video, these are the type of stories I want in Doctor Who and in art in general. I want political undertones, I want real world issues, I want people to mould their personal experiences into creative media. My problem is not at all the fact that the show is tackling racism here, my problem is the way the show does it. To me, constraining a topic as serious and as broad as this into essentially a 5 minute conversation at the end of one episode does more harm than good. Racism is obviously an incredibly serious problem that people around the world face every single day. It's not something simple you can just drop into a different plot. In my opinion, presenting racism in this way makes it feel like the show doesn't actually care about tackling the issue, and instead the studio just felt like they had to include it. If these themes and issues were talked about and tackled in an episode primarily about them, brilliant, that's exactly what I want. I just don't like the way they're being handled at the moment. Moving on from this, there are a few things I actually really like about this episode. For example, Shooty's performance in the final conversation I just mentioned is phenomenal, again he perfectly mixes frustration and anger with a genuine need to help people. In this exchange he says something along the lines of, I don't care what you think, let me help you. He knows exactly why Lindy and the others are refusing to come with him, but he's still desperate to save them. This is the Doctor. I think this bit of writing is incredible. This is something I haven't mentioned so far in the video, but I also really like the costume design in this episode. All the clothes being pastel and perfect fits the story super well, and it made Fine Time feel like a genuine different world. Rogue also frustrated me a lot due to poor writing, a lot of plot holes, and similar depth issues that I had with Dot and Bubble. First of all, I want to talk about my issues with the story. There's a moment in this episode where Rogue accuses the Doctor of being a cholder, a shape-shifting owl person. The Doctor defends himself by pointing out he's had multiple faces. That makes no sense. You're a shapeshifter. No I'm not, look at how many times I've shifted shape. Like what? In the next scene, Rogue asks what Gallifrey is, so it's not even like he believed the Doctor was a Time Lord and so knew he wasn't a Cholder, it just makes no sense. The plot of this episode is that a bunch of aliens watch Bridgerton and decided they wanted to roleplay as different characters in 19th century England. The Doctor explains this by saying TV signals carry across the entire universe, and okay now this is a nitpick that I don't actually care about, but Bridgerton is a Netflix exclusive, meaning it's not broadcast using TV signals. Again, I don't actually care about this mistake, I just think it's funny that they could have picked literally like any other show and it would have worked. The last plot hole I remember comes near the end of the episode when Ruby's stuck in the trap with the shoulder. We're shown throughout this episode that this trap means you can't move because you're essentially glued to the ground. So how can Rogue just shoulder barge Ruby out of the way and take her place? Speaking of this trap, I really hate the way it's handled. There's a part in this episode where the Doctor uses his sonic on it and says it can now hold six people but we can only use it once. This just feels so gimmicky to me. It seems like the writers just needed to give the episode some stakes, so they made up these restrictions. 
When Ruby's stuck in this trap, the show builds it up like the Doctor is going to have to sacrifice her to get rid of the shoulder. This is a good idea. Making the Doctor choose between saving everyone and saving his companion is a good way to build tension in an episode. However, Ruby is put in a near-death situation in literally every single story except Dot and Bubble, so by this point I couldn't care less about this. At the end of the episode, there's a moment where Ruby notices the Doctor is lying about being okay, so she tells him to be quiet and gives him a hug. This could have been a really nice moment if we'd actually seen their relationship develop. Like I mentioned before, this series has completely skipped over any instances of the pair bonding, so emotional moments like this just don't have the same impact they would have had in previous seasons. This episode also tries to tackle homophobia. I don't want to spend half the video repeating myself, but I have a similar issue with this as I do with Dot and Bubble. It's literally the exact same point. These are the types of stories I want art to tell, these are the real world problems I want to see tackled, but they need more depth than is shown here. Also, Rogue and the Doctor's relationship felt so fan fiction-y here. Not every gay relationship in media needs to be like Heartstopper. I actually thought The Legend of Ruby Sunday was alright. It's not perfect, but I don't have as many issues with it as the rest of this series. The logic of the time window doesn't really work, it's largely based on memories, but they continue looking at the past after the Doctor has left the church, and Ruby's a newborn so it's not like she would remember. Also, Unit says they can analyse the footage by sharpening the pixels, but it's a VHS tape, meaning it doesn't have pixels, but regardless of this, I thought these scenes in the time window were pretty decent. Like I said earlier, I think Susan Triad showing up across the different locations the Doctor and Ruby visit is cool. It's a much better example of this type of storytelling than the snow. I did think the anagram reveal was quite weak, but it was fine, I guess. That's exactly what this episode is. Fine. The introduction to Seca at the end was cool. I liked the teleprompter glitching, that felt very Doctor Who. But the suspense is cut by the MCU dialogue when the 13 year old on the Segway says, Probability of trap, 100% like, shut the f up. You're staring at an intergalactic god of death. Russell, you don't need to write this goofy ass line. This is the first half of a two part finale, so there's much more to say about the next episode than this one. Oh my god. God, what a disappointment this episode was. This might be the most lacklustre finale to a series of anything I've ever watched. I don't think there's a single thing in this 50 minutes that I liked or that felt satisfying. This episode is supposed to have the answers to the four overarching mysteries of this series and this two-parter. These are, who is Ruby's mother? What did she point at? Why can Ruby make it snow? And why did Sutek keep them alive? The answers to these are, a normal person, a road sign, no clue, and he was curious. Can you get any more mundane? Look, RTD wanted to do a shtick of an ordinary person being at the heart of an extraordinary situation for like, the fourth time. Cool, sure. Moffat did a better in one line in a Christmas special, but whatever. I'm fine with this idea of having Ruby and her mum be regular people, but if this is the case, they need to actually be regular people. One of them shouldn't be able to make it snow at will anywhere across space and time, and the other shouldn't be dressed like a Sith Lord turning around to ominously point at a road sign to name her child when no one else is around. I've seen loads of people say, their story isn't over, there's going to be explanations in the next season. First of all, why should I even bother watching the next season if these nine episodes culminated in such a dull conclusion? And second, if in the future you change information that was previously explicitly told to the viewers, for example by saying Ruby's mum isn't actually a normal person, that's not a mystery, that's a retcon. Mysteries should of course have red herrings that throw us off course and stop us guessing the reveal, but when the reveal is a road sign that literally just was not in the original scene, that's an objectively bad mystery. I thought Seket was incredibly underdeveloped in this episode, and the idea of him clinging onto the TARDIS since Tom Baker's era just doesn't work. What happened when 10 dropped the TARDIS into a fusion reactor, or when 11 flew the TARDIS into the sun? Why didn't Seket stop the Doctor escaping the Pandorica, or help House when he had control of the TARDIS? This reveal is just downright stupid. Seket being attached to the TARDIS acts like the TARDIS is a really important part of the show, which it should be. It defines the Doctor. He stole it from the other Time Lords, he literally gets called a madman with a box so many times throughout the previous eras. There's an 11th Doctor episode where the Doctor is able to speak to the TARDIS as it's been transported into a woman's body, and they have one of the most emotional exchanges in the show because they've been together for most of his life. But, like I said, the TARDIS is hardly in this series, so Seket being attached to it means nothing. This emotional connection to the TARDIS is also why I hate the fact that Doctor just duplicated it when he bi-generated. If you can make more TARDISes, it defeats the entire idea of the show being about the last Time Lord with the last TARDIS. 
Back to Seca, he's meant to be an unstoppable god of death, and he's beaten by a bungee cord. Why does the TARDIS have an Iron Man laser to help it start? Why doesn't Seca just cut the cord with his massive claws before he enters the Time Vortex? Why does he willingly rip the side of the Time Vortex if this is what brings everyone back to life? And why does he only burn up when the bungee cord is cut? Because he's way more than 73 yards away from the TARDIS here, so he's already out of the bubble of safety around it. There's one point in this episode where Unit's 13-year-old worker stands on his Segway and shoots bullets at Seca. So Russell, you change the design of the sonic screwdriver, one of the most iconic parts of the show because you somehow think it looks like a gun and you're worried kids will pretend to shoot each other with it in schools, but you'll put a 13 year old in charge of an integrated assault rifle. If you're going to make these absolutely stupid decisions, at least be consistent with them. Also, why does everyone speak so slowly? Remember when the Doctor used to be quick-witted down monologues and talk fast and have a brain that raced around figuring stuff out? That was cool, wasn't it? You know, when the character actually had some of their defining traits? Please just give Shooty some good dialogue and stop making him be so blockbustery with the delivery. Speaking of bad dialogue, oh my god, the scene where Ruby meets her mum is atrocious. Can you imagine sitting in front of your mother, the woman you've been searching for for 20 years for the very first time, and saying, I was named after a road. This line is absolutely terrible. Also, if the answer to finding Ruby's mum was always just to go 20 odd years into the future and check the entire country's DNA database that the Doctor already knew about, why didn't they just do that in the first place? Additionally, if her mother's DNA is on a database, why does the ambulance in Boom glitch out so much in trying to find Ruby's next of kin? This is another example of building something up to be important just for it to mean absolutely nothing. I cannot believe that Russell T Davis has fallen from writing the Bad Wolf Saga to this. Finally, Ruby's goodbye to the Doctor was so nothing. For the millionth time, why am I meant to care about them saying goodbye to each other when I haven't seen their relationship develop at all? Overall, I really hated this series. Ruby didn't develop at all between the beginning and end of the series, and her relationship with the Doctor wasn't shown at all. There's about two scenes in the TARDIS, and the stories are so nothing-y. Shooty has given some incredible performances. He has the potential to be such a good Doctor, but he's just being wasted on terrible scripts. It's the same thing that happened with Jodie. The Doctor feels like a side character in his own show because there's no stories that push him forward as a character. We don't get a sense of him as a person at all because the writing is that bad. I don't feel connected to any character in the show because none of them seem like actual people. Doctor Who needs to sort itself out. If it wants to retain viewers and actually have engagement, it needs good storytelling, developed characters, and some actually interesting adventures. This video has been very negative, but like I said at the beginning, this is just a TV show. Yeah, I used to love it, and I still love the previous season, so it sucks that I really dislike this new era so far, but it's really not that deep. I'm not going to lose sleep over it. If you care that much about a show, you probably need to go outside. Similarly, if you care enough about my opinions on the show to get angry, go outside. Alright, hope you enjoyed. Bye.